All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here with another awesome match for you guys. Harry Potter trading card game best of three between two of our revival players, Donovan and Wamin here. So it's going to be awesome. I can't wait to jump into the game and see what these guys have brought to the table tonight. It looks like Donovan will be using Professor Snape as his starting character. And it looks like Harry Triumphant is going to be the character that we're starting on the bottom here. And that's really cool because um, Harry Triumphant is not a starting wizard that we see almost ever. And his ability is at the end of each of your turns, if you played an adventure card this turn, you may draw up to four cards. So it's really cool. It's a nice little um, card advantage to refill your hand. And the nice thing is in this deck, you'll probably be playing those adventures at the full honest cost of two actions. And when you do that, um, you'll still be able to kind of refill. So, so you'll take a turn off by only playing one card from hand and getting four more into hand. Really be able to just kind of reload there. And Professor Snape, of course, is a popular starting character, as all of the professors are, because they give you that inherent lesson. So we've already begun the game with one potion lesson. And of course, Snape's other ability is that he can heal up to seven cards from the discard pile back into your deck. Now, Donovan kind of uh, basically with a handful of lessons here, but at least the first two turns kind of speak for themselves. And I wouldn't hate to see us develop the Pomfrey early, since this is kind of where we're going to have that time. And of course, when I spoke about playing the adventures for an honest price, I had a feeling that there might be Fred and George in, and we do see that Fred and George are in the deck here on the bottom for Wamin. So we are going to be playing plenty of adventures, replacing our own adventures, and playing them for only one cost to take full, full advantage of Harry Triumphant. So that's pretty neat. I also just like it mostly because it's a strategy we don't see too often when it comes to the adventure decks. Something to note here is that we haven't really seen any of our um, charms yet. Even though we have a handful of charm spells, we have only drawn care magical creatures lessons, but that's okay because both of these players are going to be taking their slow, sweet time playing lessons for the first turn. If you're, I mean, you probably go into a uh, an adventure immediately in the next turn to take advantage of getting your adventure lock in and start getting the Harry Triumphant. Actually, sorry, it's probably Fred and George immediately and then an adventure following suit after that. It looks like we used one action to play a lesson and one action to draw a card. Very interesting. I see the merits of um, holding lessons in your hand and not having zero lessons in hand when we're playing in a caught by Snape meta, but here I'm surprised that we didn't play down the second care magical creatures lesson on turn one. And it looks like we are going to be dropping Fred and George Weasley, like I said. The Weasley twins, of course, here they're going to be reducing the cost of adventures by one action. Normally adventures cost both of your actions for the turn. That is going to be two actions to play the character, though, so that is our entire turn. Donovan is going to respond with four, or sorry, two more lessons, bringing our total up to five. Because Snape is in play, and five is that kind of a magic number where you can start doing some pretty scary stuff. Five Lessons is kind of that breaking point where they know when they're designing this game that short of starting with a character, you're not going to be able to play any five lesson cards earlier than turn three. So a lot of them have some pretty potent effects. That's where you start to see things like the platform nine and three quarters. Oh, excuse me. I've got the hiccups. Platform nine and three quarters, snuffling potion, etc. Moon Seed is going to be 8, Gold Cauldron is 9, but Foul Brew is playable. Foul Brew, you can tell this is a base set card because for 5 energy, you're only dealing 2 damage.
Wow, we're just going to keep stacking the potions lessons. I mean, why not? Our opponent has played Diagon Alley, the adventure. Um, Diagon Alley says your opponent can't use actions to draw cards. Uh, and to solve, your opponent has to skip a total of seven actions. Um, so the real big thing here with Diagon Alley is that you are trying to get your opponent to just exhaust their resources and not be able to refill them. Um, I don't think we're doing much to actually prevent our opponent from doing things besides, you know, because we can't play the other adventures when Diagon Alley's down. Um, so it doesn't stop things like uh, Peeves or Colin Creevy. And we do get up to eight. So Moonseed Poison is going to be coming down. Moonseed Poison is one of the kind of uh, the item payoffs for just going pure potions here. Uh, when you play the card, you deal three damage to your opponent. And then you may use another action to do six damage to your opponent. Um, so all in all, it's two actions for nine. It's not the worst, but it could be better. Um, one of the benefits of Moonseed Poison is that because it is an eight cost item, it can come into play, deal that three damage up front. Then you can take advantage of it with cards that deal damage based on the items, especially based on item costs like Arthur Weasley and kind of double dip into dealing damage with the moon seed there. Goodness, once you get to nine, do you really need to accelerate uh, another three to go up to 12? What can you even play up there, man? Like once you get up to nine, just start doing venomous tentacular juices, right? This gold cauldron scares me because it means that there's an even bigger payoff card here. Nearly headless Nick in all of his beautiful colored glory. Straight from the poster. Looks like we finally got some of that pressure down that we have established the gargoyles. Yes, two gargoyles now are flying in to attack Donovan. So we are going to have both of these gargoyles dealing, um, of course, remember they are three damage because even though it says one, the gargoyles do an extra two damage if there are no creatures on the other side of the table. Return Donovan has drawn the gold cauldron and this is where we're starting to see Diagon Alley be a real pain in the butt because uh, he can't use any actions to get more action in his hand, which means he's seeing one card a turn and has to come up with two things to do, right? Because two actions, one card. It looks like we are going to use one of our actions on the foul brew, and we are going to kill one of the gargoyles. Smart move, stop that damage now because it is just going to get out of hand very quickly. Six damage a turn is 10% of your total health pool. So it's just, uh, it's more than that once you consider the fact that you've like drawn seven cards to start the game. And again, the gargoyle, sandstone gargoyle, three drop, uh, marble gargoyle, the five drop. These two gargoyles, probably the strongest creatures because um, they're low to the ground, they have a really high ceiling, and at the end of the day, even if your opponent is playing creatures, they just have a decent amount of health. They're not really going to get removed too easily, um, especially the Marble Gargoyle. And these guys are able to just have that, that high pressure where even if your opponent does have the creatures to play to mitigate some of their damage, they're kind of forced to play them right away, and you're dictating their next move. Um, looks like Bulgeye is one of the damage that we took from Sandstone Gargoyle there. So that is one of the uh, higher than nine cost cards we have in the deck to pay off. Well, they're just doing a bunch of damage. And you're starting to see the, um, the idea behind this deck immediately present on the field here as the combination of Diagon Alley and Harry Triumphant 
Um, Harry gave us that immediate card draw refund. Diagon Alley is giving us that uh, slow overtime card advantage just by denying our opponent the ability to generate more card advantage. Um, it looks like when we pass turn, we did draw. It is a Noxious Poison. Noxious Poison is going to discard one of the lessons to deal five damage to an opponent or a creature. We could use this to kill the other gargoyle. Actually, I like using this to kill the other gargoyle more than I like going for the face because we have to solve a lot more than a face race, right? Um, we have to basically build something and then deploy it. So I think we need to buy ourselves time right now to find those cards. So I think we get rid of the monster, but it looks like we chose the face. So yeah, we are just going to hit five to the face, still taking that three every turn from the gargoyle. It's gonna add up quick. We feel like we've got a lot of cards in deck right now at 39, but I'm telling you, it's gonna add up. Diagon Alley is certainly putting in work in this matchup. Let's look like, at uh, some of the other cards we got here. So Hover Charm is in this deck. That's one of the cards, it's just going to go ahead and reset a card that's put into play. Um, almost time walking the opponent there. Purple Firecrackers is going to let them uh, choose three cards in their hand and discard them. So this is just probably the most popular hand disruption spell. End of your feast lets you go get more adventures out of your discard pile. Four adventures, in fact, from your discard pile to your hand. Um, and Haggard Needs Help is an incredible adventure to be looping. Looks like we're going to get Haggard and three letters from no one's. Um, so Letters from No One says they can only use actions to draw cards. It's the exact opposite of Diagon Alley. And um, you want to do that to them once they have a bunch of cards in their hand. Uh, it's kind of like the reverse punish. I mean, a lot of this looks a lot like the Fred and George deck. We've just kind of tweaked it with more heavy on the charms and a little more hairy triumphants. Um, I do like this deck from Woman. I think that this is a really cool new angle on some of these adventure cards and some of these concepts. certainly feels like it's doing more than the mono potion deck as well we will see the potions deck hasn't really drawn into any of those big bomb payoff cards yet although we can't afford the nine or ten cost cards now but with one of those potions we could i said potions i meant cauldron but we do also literally need one potions but well, we would have to do yet. Yeah, it was going to be the, um, it would have to be potion, gold cauldron would be our two actions. Now it looks like on his turn, Donovan replaced the adventure with letters from no one saying that you can now only use, uh, actions to draw cards. Um, and the reward of course, is that the opponent discards five cards from their hand. The idea being that you've um you've been controlling their hand size so that their entire turn is using the actions to draw cards and then try to solve letters from no one um again solving these adventures solving letters from no one immediately is pretty important um instead see we we yeah we use the turn of making him discard all those cards uh or sorry use actions just to draw cards and now we're going to play escaping the dursleys which is they can't play any cards except lessons and the solve is they discard their hand now i do like escaping the dursleys in a lot of situations i i don't know how much i like it here and this is only because of something that players um again as as the average level of our players kind of increases over time and over practice and over games i do believe that peeves will be in more lists um, Peeves should be in every single list of at least a one of. You snap solve escaping the Dursleys here. You go get a Peeves. You put it into play and you use it. You would uh, disrupt your opponent's hand. You would fill your hand back up. Um, and again, it, you would disrupt your opponent being able to play a Peeves. Not that we know if this list is running one. But again, I can't say this enough. Every list should run Peeves. Um, at the very least, you should have it escaping the Dursleys out. There should be a plan. We'll see what Donovan's plan is right now because it looks like we are solving escaping the Dursleys. And where will we be escaping to? Where, where, where?
nearly headless neck. Now, see, what I really would like to see is us get a VTJ because um, Venomous Tentacular Juice will obliterate our opponent, making them draw double what's in their hand. We would just win. We've got a whole bunch of potion lessons on the table, too. Nine, in fact. So, yeah, if actually, if we played... Um, if we played Venomous Tentacular Juice in our deck, that's game. I wonder if it's just not in the list. Potions Class Disaster is clearly our um, our build towards card here. Potions Class Disaster is if your opponent, uh, sorry, your opponent chooses five of their cards and discards them. Um, the cards can come from either the hand or in play. That's it. That's the entire effect of this card. Um, we did a card of the day on this card where we talk a little bit about how this is a very underwhelming top end. Um, your opponent will simply just discard five cards from their hand more often than not. In most semi-competitive and competitive games of Harry Potter, your opponent will have ways to increase the number of cards in their hand or have just a significant amount of card advantage. Um, so I think that Potions Class Disaster, without controlling your opponent in another way, isn't nearly as effective as we'd like it to be. And in any of those times where you try to control your opponent in another way, that's going to have a significant deck building cost and it makes it harder and harder to play potions class disaster to build up to 12 potions lessons without something crazy happening especially considering a lot of the good potions payoff cards require you to sacrifice those lessons and again i mean it's like beating a dead horse but it's why vtj is so good vtj is a kill spell at nine that deals more damage than most of the cards in potion could ever dream of and doesn't require you to discard any of the lessons in play in fact a balancing act i would really like to have seen done on vtj was to make it cost lessons from play i think that would have been a huge deal uh it looks like we are just using nearly headless nick oh no sorry nearly headless nick is uh is it our head we're using snape and we're healing we're healing seven cards it looks like we only healed three of them uh there's definitely cards in the discard pile that you know we could stand to see back in the deck um your deck is literally your hit points i would have put the full seven cards back into the deck uh it's one or the other right it's either put all seven cards in the deck or don't use snape yet See, now that we solved escaping the Dursleys, um, what's going to happen next is Diagon Alley is just going to come down again, and then we're not going to be able to draw any cards, and we're going to keep this weird, like, continuing chain of, hey, you can't draw any cards, okay, now all you can do is draw cards, okay, now discard your entire hand back down to zero. Um, Peeves or Colin Creevy would really, really help us get out of this situation. But as it stands, I just don't know that there's enough Donovan can do in those tiny, tiny little breathing rooms that he gets in between these adventures. Um, especially not with what we see in hand. Yeah, so we used our last action to just uh, draw another card from the deck there. I think that's pretty telling. Um, when we see Harry down here is going to just play. There it is. Letters from no one. Okay, how are you going to solve this? You can only use actions to draw cards. You have to discard five cards to solve it. Uh, your next turn is literally going to be top deck, then draw two cards with actions, and then solve the adventure before your turn's over, I think. Actually, no, I would leave the adventure in play, and I would solve the adventure um, before my, uh, my next main. So it looks like um, we did just draw uh, for deck, draw for turn, and then pass, like I said. The three damage is coming in from the Sandstone Gargoyle, and now Marble Gargoyle is here to play, and now Purple Firecrackers is going to make us discard three of those cards from our hand. Um, that kind of sucks because now we don't even have to replace letters from no one. It just walks Donovan's entire last turn back. Um, basically gave us an, it gave Wamin an entire free turn to play this Marble Gargoyle. Totally scot-free. So yeah, we're going to purple Firecrackers, get rid of those three cards. Now on your next turn, you're going to be doing the same thing. You're going to draw, you're going to use actions to draw two more cards because that's the only thing you can use your actions for. 
and uh, you're going to be preparing to solve letters from no one again. You might be enticed to solve it at the end of your turn because of what just happened to you. But I don't think that's the right play either. Because if you're Donovan, you have to start doing something more proactive. And um, the adventures that one means playing are preventing you from doing anything proactive at all. So we are going to solve the letters from no one at the end of our turn there. I think that's a little bit of a trap. Because now we're just going to play another letters from no one down, right? Put him in the exact same spot. But we shall see. Now, if I'm Donovan, what do I need to get out of this? I mean, we've already answered this question, right? It's Venomous Tentacular Juice. Venomous Tentacular Juice is the card. It wins the game for us. It would have won the game for us for a couple turns now. I don't think we're playing any in the list, which, you know, I get it. Budget list. Some people just like to play what they own. Some people don't like to play with things that are maybe too busted or too good. But um, as it stands, since VTJ hasn't been touched by the band of restricted list, I still think that if you're playing especially a mono potion deck, that you just need that level of payoff at the end of all this work. I mean, we've done all this work and we're just not really reaping much of what we've sown here. Um, as we take another three damage to the face, another eight damage to the face. Sorry, excuse me, because of marble plus sandstone. And we're just watching that health pool hemorrhage. And now just thinking about things like how we didn't heal all seven cards with Snape. As we start to look at that number of cards in our deck just dwindling down, 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 down. I think that we're going to maybe see a slight change in play style from Donovan in the next game. Now that we know that uh, basically our opponent's just trying to make sure we don't get to do any of the things that we want to do. Yep, so that is going to be an exact rinse and repeat. Letters from No One comes down as the follow-up from Huamin. And Donovan uses his actions to draw cards. And we are back to exactly the same spot we were at two turns ago as far as board state. But the difference is Donovan's taken 16 damage since then. I can't afford to take another one. And I think this is going to be the end of game one. And we're going to move right on to game two here because we're able to kill one of these guys. Well, no, not even because the letters from no one. Um, if we used one action to draw a card, then we solved by discarding five that we would be able to use one of the noxious potions to kill one of the small gargoyles. It's still not enough because we take five from the big gargoyle and draw to kill ourselves. So that is game one. The winner is going to be Harry. Harry Triumphant, not a starting wizard that I thought would be taking any wins anytime soon. Coming in here, just, uh, you know, it's card advantage, man. It's just showing that the adventures are powerful. I don't know that this is necessarily better than just starting with uh, Fred and George, although Fred and George, I believe, sorry, excuse me, they're banded revival. So um, it is strictly better than cheating, right? It is better than starting with Fred and George. Um, but I think Seamus Finnegan or maybe something like some action advantage um, might be a slightly better pick. But I'm not going to hate too much on Harry Triumphant here because he did the thing. He drew the cards all those turns. He made sure we always had the action we needed. Um, and Harry won that game. Now, Harry, of course, would uh, be in a totally different position if we were playing Venomous Tentacular Juice in the potions deck. But I think... You know, it, when you, once you kind of know that you're safe from that, once you don't see it, once they don't search for it off of the Dursleys, you don't really worry about your hand size anymore. Um, and we did just show people the Burrow combo last week, so I know that hand size is on the mind because um, you do have to be careful of decks that are playing the right colors, green and blue, of just kind of like nuking you if your hand size is too small with that combo. But that combo has a lot of tells. There's a lot of ways to know what's coming. There's a lot of... Uh, your opponent has to be in a very specific situation for it to even be possible. And you can usually tell if they're working on setting themselves up for that position that that's what they're trying to do. And knowledge is power, right? Once you know how that combo works and you know what they're trying to do to you, you can usually uh, work pretty well at trying to stop it. 
from lining up so nicely for them at least i mean obviously they still have ways to try and use it on you it wouldn't be a very good combo if it just died as soon as somebody knew what was going on all right so we are going to game two here of course we are going to get to decide whether or not donovan wants to go first because we did drop game one donovan ramped up the lessons just like they wanted to do but just didn't have the payoffs at the end i mean we saw one moon seed poison we saw a potions class disaster sadly get discarded as we realized it just wasn't getting played that game um, we saw a perfect opportunity to search for a VTJ for, uh, literally for lethal, where we just didn't have it in the deck. Um, you know, some of those things, kind of hindsight 2020 moments, and again, like we were saying before, maybe just that we're playing with cards we own, or cards that are accessible to us, and we're not trying to use the VTJs. Now this is Revival. So the players are able to sideboard, which is what's happening right now in between these games. So Donovan is able to add some adventure hate or maybe some things like peeves or ways to just draw those cards to get around escaping the Dursleys. Hopefully some VTJs, add in just a couple more, you know, pop pop power cards. And Wamin, I imagine, is just going to be, oh, okay, maybe a little item hate here, maybe tweaking some of the adventure counts, but nothing crazy. We're not too worried about anything um, that we saw last game. So let's see what these players can do in game two. And appreciate that always when they reveal the hand to me, it makes it a lot easier for us to uh, speculate. Now, you do wish that you saw Fred and George a little earlier, um, but you don't hate seeing Haggard Needs Help as one of your early adventures. Oftentimes, your opponent is forced to just solve Haggard Needs Help right away, um, so their turn will end up being like, play one lesson, solve Haggard Needs Help. And now you're playing the game as if you went second, except uh, you've dealt your opponent probably 13 more damage. Or sorry, 11 more damage. So, Haggard Needs Help pretty good at uh accelerating the game much faster usually than the opponent even realizes it's happening so here it is uh, haggard needs help is coming down into play here haggard demands help uh he's kind of hard to ignore he's taking away one of your actions every turn until you help him including the turn that you solve the adventure so donovan will be solving this adventure i mean we have to have to have to solve haggard immediately living with haggard is just going to be a almost insurmountable amount of action disadvantage us only getting that one action a turn um and we know that our opponent is just going to replace the adventure whenever you know it, it suits them so just sitting there and living under that and never really getting to solve it is a little tough oh man those revival cards sure just pop out don't they and speaking of this might be the first revival card that we've seen tonight so polyjuice potion is here um man these cards just look good Polyjuice Potion is a new revival card that uh, to play this card, you discard one of your potion lessons and you choose a witch or wizard and the starting character gains all abilities of that card until the end of the turn. So it's pretty neat. It's a pretty cool design space. Polyjuice Potion, right? Obviously the flavor win is there. Barely even need to explain that one. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the powerful targets for Polyjuice in this and I... I'm actually coming up short, right? I think Polyjuice Potion could be used in a lot of really effective ways. But against what Wamin presented last game, uh, we're basically only looking at Polyjuicing the starting character or Polyjuicing the um, the Fred and George. And I don't think we play any adventures, so both of those characters aren't really going to be worth polying for us. Um, again, we... I didn't see this last game. We only saw like 20 or sorry, 40 something cards from the deck. So it could be that this was in the deck and we just didn't see it. I sure hope we didn't side this in. If anything, I would have sided this out. But maybe we're not messing with sideboards. That's also something that not everybody is prepared to do. Um, and it looks like escaping the Dursleys is going to be adventure number two. Drawing another four cards. Not worried at all. We didn't see Grip Hook. We didn't see VTJ. Let's just fill up our hand up our hand we're never going to get punished 
or at least we don't think we're going to get punished from what we've seen. Oh, excuse me, these hiccups today from what we've seen so far. Um, mind you, this is highly punishable, just not by what our opponent is playing. Uh, something like an escaping the jerseys into filling our hand with all these cards is is really sus because the proper and best answer to escaping the jerseys, which again, remember every deck should have this answer, so it should be pretty scary to play jerseys blind into somebody, uh, is Peeves. And if we did grab that Peeves now and use it, all the Harry Triumphant has done is essentially damaged us eight extra, right? So I do think that's a little bit scary. I don't know that playing Escaping the Dursleys is like a snap play there because again, your opponent just sideboarded and I would give my opponent the benefit of the doubt and assume that they sideboarded a bunch of peeves into their deck once they saw the Escaping the Dursleys. But nope, we're just going to slam it down and we are rewarded for our faith in Escaping the Dursleys as our opponent just does not have the peeves in the deck. They decided to discard and to go get beetle eyes beetle eyes is a good pick because beetle eyes is going to give you some more action uh more than just like a card's worth of action because when you play beetle eyes you will deal four damage to your opponent but then of course you can use an action to discard it from play to search your deck and get a bulge eye potion so it's cool because it's kind of doing something on the way in and it will pop itself to let you go get another card that you can play Especially when you have an empty hand, that seems like a pretty good deal to me. Letters from No One is going to be the next adventure. And uh, we're starting to see, you know, basically, Wamin doesn't have to do anything. Wamin just has to play this lock game and eventually get some character or some creatures down, sorry, excuse me, um, to just deal the damage to break the parity. But Donovan might be able to, you know, get some damage out and kind of break that parity and make it so that Wamin has to be more active, more proactive of actually trying to end the game. Uh, but I think his letters from no one is probably going to stop us up for a while, especially because we're down to zero cards at hand. So yeah, we drew for turn. We're going to draw another two with two actions, I imagine. Um, and just pass it there. And again, um, we're just going to keep filling our hand. There's no reason not to. No punish is coming. We are confident no punish is coming. Uh, but do remember, guys, that there are punishments. Uh, things like Peeves. Things like Grip Hook. Venomous Tentacular Juice. These cards see a lot of play and just filling your hand with cards for, you know, just because can get you hurt in a lot of those situations. Uh, there are cards that could easily, all three of these cards could be in this deck too, without stretching at all. They're just not. I get it, right? Grip Hook isn't central or even um, really adjacent to the Snape strategy at all. It just is nice right now because our opponent happens to be doing what they are doing uh so we are going to snape here to put a bunch of the potions back into the deck uh it looks like we're going bulgeye noxious dragon's blood just a lot of the the damage the burn potion spells um and yeah we see that that's kind of just what this deck is doing right it's just fair potion damage so we're doing things just like Bulgeye, Noxious Poison, Dragon's Blood is just, you know, an 11 damage for two discards. Um, we're going the straight damage route. Moonseed Poison, Beetle Eyes. And I think, you know, we're just going this big, big D, big damage, big damage energy. I think it's just hard to justify ignoring the uh, Venomous Tentacular Juice. But we won't keep beating that dead horse. We're going to finally start building some lessons here from the uh, Harry deck. Getting our first care magical creatures and charms down. Next turn, probably going to go ahead and just slam down a second COMC and play the gargoyle. Um, just start that clock start the three damage return because right now we're about you know six or seven cards behind our opponent 
I imagine he's gonna be drawing with an action is why I say that number. Yep, so we are going to use both of our actions just to draw more cards for the deck. And again, I would not solve this here. I would wait, but... We're probably going to opt to solve it before the end of our turn. I would make him decide whether or not he wants to spend an action replacing his own adventure or not. I wouldn't just solve it and give him like an open adventure slot for his next adventure. It's a tough one to decide. Yeah, and it looks like we are going to solve before we pass the turn. Not my favorite timing on that, but okay. Holding on to Dear Life. Holding on to Nearly Headless Nick here, which is interesting. Nearly Headless Nick is a character that doesn't see really much play at all. Um, he has a once per game ability where you can search your deck and you can take two item cards, show them to your opponent, and put them in your hand. Um... It's, I, I can see the merit because almost all of our damage comes from these potions and poisons. These these item cards are, you know, some of them are spells, but there's a lot of items. I just don't think it was worth, uh, it's worth the time because that's two actions to play Nearly Headless like Nick and then another action just to find two of the cards you want. I'd rather just be drawing cards, um, drawing more cards and, and just seeing the cards I want more frequently as a result of that, because that helps you with all of the parts of your strategy. Nearly Headless Nick just feels uh, pretty slow. I mean, not that there isn't merit there. I just think that we don't have that kind of time. And then we called that one there. It's another care of magical creatures and the gargoyle. Exactly as we predicted. So now Donovan's staring down the barrel of his gargoyle and knows the kind of damage that can dish out over time. Uh, is kind of thanking his lucky stars that he's not looking at both gargoyles right now, but it is only a matter of time. Although, if I was a gambling man, I would say that the next two plays from uh, Huamin are going to be Fred and George and then an adventure the turn after that. It's probably going to be Fred and George followed by Adventure Lesson, Followed by Lesson Gargoyle, if I had to guess. And it looks like we are going to spend those two actions to play Nearly Headless Nick. Oh, sorry, he's not an action to use him. He's just a once per game. Uh, so it is two actions to search for two items that you want. Put them in your hand. Again, um, I don't know that it's 100% worth. Uh, do we have the other item? Are we searching for it? The one where if we have the bulge eye and the beetle eyes potion we get to do right There's like a card that if you have both of them something happens I know beetle eyes searches for bulge eye. I just feel like there was something else, but maybe not um, So we're gonna play the nearly headless Nick and we're going to go get a beetle eyes. Yeah, we can't even play the other guy. So we're gonna get a beetle eyes and beetle eyes and beetle eyes and. Man, just look at the card difference though, right? The cards in hand. Seventeen cards in Wamin's hand, and again, uh, not that we're in a position to be able to cast one, but oh boy, we are absolutely in VTJ death range here. We are well beyond VTJ death range, actually. We're just looking at um, how the adventures that we've been oppressing Donovan with, plus Harry, have just created that huge card advantage.
we're about neutral on actions, all things considered, when you think about the fact that the other bombs, or sorry, the other cards were harder to interact with. We haven't seen many bombs in this uh, list here. The bomb cards we're looking for are the nine drop venomous tentacular juice we haven't seen running around. Oh, we got uh, five. So, um, I was wrong. If I was a betting man, I would owe somebody some money. We did not go Fred and George. We did not go Adventure. We're just getting right to the creatures. We want to get to the good stuff. Uh, we put down two more lessons and said, go ahead, your turn. So now we're back to Donovan. We got those. We got the items that we wanted. Self-steering cauldron is the best cauldron. And eel eyes here. Uh, eel eyes is the... Oh, this is maybe the one I was thinking of. When you play this card, look at your opponent's hand. You may use an action to discard this card and Beetle Eyes for play to search your deck, and you can take Bulljai and put it into play. Yeah, so Eel Eyes. Eel Eyes and Beetle Eyes are cool because you get to put Bulljai Potion into play without having to pay for it, and Bulljai is expensive, so you do not want to pay for it. Um, so I do like that we finally got Eel Eyes and we have uh, Beetle Eyes out. So now uh, we can use, we can play this and look at our opponent's hand, then we can use an action and get rid of this and Beetle Eyes, um, and that will put the Bull Dry into play. And the Bull Dry, of course, will deal damage when it comes into play, and then also on the way out the door. And I think now we might change the sound of our tune here. Um, we might not go right into the marble gargoyle because we've seen okay hold up hold up he's got eel eyes he's got eel eyes and beetle eyes is already out and maybe just maybe he's gonna put together some kind of crazy potion damage combo so since i've got all these adventures in my hand let me just go ahead and step right in front of that and stop any of that nonsense from happening so self-stirring cauldron is going to come into play and discard two potions but it does refund the lesson, or sorry, the action. So we are up to seven lessons, and we still have one. Oh, actually, sorry, we still have both of our actions. We, um, I don't believe we used one yet. I think we only played the self-steering cold. That's interesting that we played self-stirring there. I would have just played Eel Eyes and done the thing with my extra action. Um, I don't think ramping up to seven lessons is doing anything extra for us. In fact, we're just playing a three cost card and discarding another one of our lessons anyway. Putting ourselves in a position where we would be in some deep, deep shit if our opponent did literally anything about our self-stirring culture. And considering we're playing a, a mostly items deck and we let our opponent sideboard, it's pretty wild to uh, to just think that our opponent with like a 15 card hand isn't going to do anything about our self-stirring cauldron and just walk us all the way back into the stone age when it comes to our uh, our lessons. And yeah, I was just about to say, I don't think we discarded the potions lesson that we needed to. Um, he's putting the potions to discard, then he's using an action to play potions from his hand. Uh, very interesting that we just are building here. Uh, so we played a Care Magical Creatures and a Marble Gargoyle. Next turn is going to be Hedwig into one of the other Gargoyles coming back. Um, and we're just going to have all that creature pressure on the table. Here, um, Eel Eyes for sure, right? Draw the card for your turn. I would jam Eel Eyes down. I would pop Eel Eyes and Beetle Eyes. Um, and I would go ahead and put that into play. Very interesting. We played Draco, Malfoy, Slytherin. Draco, I actually would love to have seen as the starter in this list because we are playing all the potion lessons anyway. Snape isn't giving us nearly as much of an advantage. 
Draco would be getting us an action refund every time we play an item, and oh boy, is this deck chock full of items. Um, this Draco is going to get a lot of value going forward, but it's the kind of card that, man, you would really like to see us taking advantage of this every turn. If we had just swapped these positions with Snape and Draco here, I think we might be in a better position uh, overall. Even with just that change, no other changes to the deck. Go ahead and play Snape as a character, because he basically is like a... He's like using an action to play a lesson and then, you know, getting a discount healing character. Now we're deciding whether or not we want to go um, Gargoyle Hedwig or just play some kind of lock type effect. We're going to skip right over the Fred and George turn and go right to the Diagon Alley, which says our opponent is right back to only uh, we can't use actions to draw cards. Now, I don't. So we saw our opponent search for the Beetle Eyes. I think our opponent just has a lot of action in a world where they can't draw cards still. And I don't know if it's um, if that's enough. So I think we skip. Don't do this culture. Just play the Beetle Eyes here. Uh, play the eel eyes, get the action back, then use one action to discard both of those and go get the bulge eye, put it into play. Uh, then you can use the second action, you know, since you get one of your actions back from Draco, uh, to crack the bulge eye. And what's the damage on that again? Let's just double check here. Oh no, are all the bulge eyes in the discard pile? Uh, oh, it's 13. 13 damage. Not bad at all. More than half of our opponent's deck. I think we should definitely be doing that kind of scary stuff. So, Purple Firecracker. Uh, now it's too late. Now our opponent has played two Purple Firecrackers, discarding our whole hand. I'm wondering why we were waiting. What we were waiting for with the Eli's. Uh, why we bothered to spend that whole turn on self-stirring Cauldron and then just playing a Noxious Potion. I would have liked to have seen the um, either the Draco come down that turn. Actually, I don't know if we had Draco yet. I feel like we might have. Um, but I would have really liked to have seen the the Beetle Eyes and the Bulge Eyes. Or sorry, not Beetle. Whatever, the other eye. The other eye one. The one cost eyes. Would have liked to have seen that instead. Val Brew is going to kill. Uh, oh no, we're just going to do two damage to the Gargoyle and not even kill it. Oh boy, that feels bad. Now we are officially in Pray That We Top Deck Beetle Eyes. Or this is Beetle Eye. Whatever. Uh, the small eyes. Oh, Eel Eyes. There we go. Oh, goodness. And the chances of a top decking Eel Eyes just went down the tubes as another one went to our damage zone. One, two, three of them in the damage zone here. Oh, maybe still one left in the deck, though. Right? Hold on. Nope. Sorry, all four uh, of those are in here. <laughs> all four bulge eyes are in here as well. Actually, maybe maybe that's why we did not um, do the potion thing. We didn't want to fail because uh, all the bulge eyes were in there. But again, that's why uh, snaping for anything short of seven is a little bit rough. I'm going to just put all the action back into the deck. I think we are just going to be running out of gas. And that is very much what the adventure decks are designed to do. Um, you kind of just, it's like letting your opponent just tire themselves out in boxing, right? Like, you're not even throwing any punches. You're kind of throwing, like, a fake every once in a while, like the Marble Gargoyles out there, kind of like, hey, it might, it might, you know, be a punch. Uh, but for the most part, you just kind of let your opponent tire themselves out, uh, draw through their deck, attempting to, to do something and not really do enough of anything to you there. So, that is going to be the win in two for while I'm in here with a Harry Triumphant deck. Again, um, Harry Triumphant. I can't talk too much smack on this guy. Not my favorite character, but here we are seeing the um, just the card advantage coming off of that working very, very, very well for him here. And um, because we can't start with Fred and George, it's kind of just supplementing the Fred and George. Uh, and we see that we are running four of them, of course, here in the list. Looks like, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I know that I already called it, but here, the turn here is going to be we're playing Pomfrey and we're healing. Uh, oh, actually, actually, maybe I called it a little early. 
So we were gonna pop free in four Bulgeyes and four uh, four Eel Eyes. And if honestly, I would put in four Beetle Eyes too. I'd just put all the eyes in there. I'd get all that stuff in there and just try and pop off two of these Bulgeye potions. Um, because let's see, if you play Eel Eyes for an action, Search, uh, you know, another action cracks both of those and gets the other guy. Then the third action pops out for 13. Yeah, you still need, like, another... Can Beetleize, Beetleize 4 damage when it comes in? Uh, it's close, it's close, because you figure your opponent's drawing cards, too. Uh, you just have to get there faster than he gets there, and healing all these cards might help with that, because the Gargoyle is... Uh, well, no, the Gargoyle is dealing 5. That's a lot. <laughs> it's... It's closer than I thought at first, but I don't think this Pomfrey is enough. I think it's too little too late, but uh, top decking the Pomfrey is pretty much a god move here, huh? I think that if we had played a few more lessons, we might be in a better spot. Oh, actually, I don't know. We have Dragon's Blood. We can only do one of these dragon's bloods. Donovan might be able to find enough damage. Um, this is one of the reasons it's actually, it's actually really rough that we didn't play Fred and George, because Wamin could just lock this game down by replacing his adventure, but he can't, because you can only replace your own adventure when Fred and George is out. It's one of their abilities. The fact that our opponent skipped any number of actions at the diagonally has to feel so good, though. <laughs> Alright, so Pomfrey puts 12, 12 pure gas cards back into the deck. And we're going to be drawing one card, and we're just like really, really hoping it's eel eyes. This is a weird place to be. Uh, oh man, oh no way, and then uh, and then Donovan took five damage, and it's one Bulgey, three eel eyes, and a potions. Oh no, dude, three of the eel eyes that he just put back into the deck, going right back into the discard pile. Um, he's really, really gonna need to draw the fourth one off the top here. Uh, but man, 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 the chances are low. Let's see if we get it. We pass the turn, and yeah, I mean. Uh, this is the old nail in the coffin, right? Just land out a Hedwig and the other Gargoyle. Let's see what Donovan gets for turn. And oh, it's just a potion lesson. And folks, that's all she wrote. That's going to be Harry Triumphant winning it in two here. Again, shout outs to this deck. This is a really cool concept of using that card advantage from Harry Triumphant, coupled with the fact that Fred and George can't be a starting character, so you're leaning on their strength as an additional character, and just attacking the adventure's advantage from two different angles. Really, really neat stuff. Um, my only notes for the potion deck are you need VTJs, you need them, need them, need them. You would have been in a, I mean, that's how you beat somebody who's being greedy with their hand size like this. Um, also, I really highly recommend for both of these decks that there should at least be a copy of Peeves. I didn't see any Peeves in Wamin's deck, but they could be in there. He is doing other character stuff. Uh, but Peeves, 100%, I would have one in Donovan's list, at least one. And if you're going to be siding in, uh, it's a great card to be able to side some more of into the deck because it does so well against strategies that either disrupt your hand or, um, you know, play things like Escaping the Dursley. So... Uh, but that is going to be it for us, guys. We will get this video uploaded for you soon. Thanks for joining us for another hour of some exciting Harry Potter trading card game action. If you were interested in what you saw here, you want to join us. We play every week. Uh, you can join the Discord. All the information is going to be on the website at the bottom left corner of the screen. HarryPotterTCG.com. Join the revival, guys. It's free. You know, it's uh, you know, we're just jamming games online. Anybody can come play. Uh, free to play, free to get started. We'd be happy to help you out. So if you're interested, just drop on by the Discord or hit up the website. Or you could always reach out to the Dark Mark. But until next time, guys, 
darkmarktcg.com for all of your Harry Potter articles and information, and harrypottertcg.com for revival news. Everybody, until next time, signing off. Thank you so much for checking out our video. Bye-bye.